You're listening to What's Ray Saying, the podcast. Now let me start by saying how sorry I am that we haven't communicated in a while, but I so look forward to us reconnecting. I missed you. But my time has been dominated over the last few months by school, both uh, teaching at the university and writing my dissertation. But we will make up for it, class. The professor is back. No need to take notes. Just listen and wonder. There will be a quiz next week. Now let me ask you. Do you know much about black Americans? Black people? Black folks? African Americans? Where do you get your information about black people. Did you ever take a class? Did you read a book? What book? How many books? Do you remember? Can you recall? Do you know how you know? Where did you learn it? What did you learn about black people in their history, their culture, their experience, their attitudes? where they live, what they've done, what they want, and what they say. Are you one? Do you know one? What's racing? What's racing? What's racing? What's From the source of all black knowledge, getting ready to start the research portion of my dissertation from a bomb-proof shelter, with pigs gaining 15 pounds a week eating apples and custom feed, and missing you all a long time, you're listening to What's Ray Saying? I'm Ray Christian. Coming up, two narratives and some commentary. My name is Dr. Meredith Evans. I'm now the director of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. But I want to tell you about what ways change the podcast. It's nothing to do with the federal government. It just has to do with history, storytelling, and social commentary to explore the black experience. I'm a proud listener. And I love it. What Ray's Saying, the podcast. Early African born slaves in America were educated in the rudimentary languages of instruction by overseers who themselves were often illiterate or barely literate. Others were trained in hand skills sufficient to perform some skilled labors like carpentry, blacksmithing, sewing. Now there are numerous exceptions where slaves were even taught to read and write indiscreetly by masters or members of the master's family or slaves learning to read on their own by extreme attention to detail when they were in close proximity to whites in possessions of reading material on a regular basis. But if caught, they would face death. Now, as a matter of law, teaching slaves to read was a crime, not only because generally educating slaves was seen as a waste of time, knowing that Slaves were happy if they were ignorant of the larger world, but also to prevent the potential to forge documents. Now, the most common slave experience was complete illiteracy. No reading, no math, no science, no history, no reasons for anything in the world but the explanations 
provided by any white person in charge. Slaves learned on their own through story, narrative, and observation. Slaves were prevented from asking excessive questions. Doing so was seen as a form of disrespect. No questions about the nature of their birth, their age, or their origins. Typically, slaves were punished for knowing the wrong responses to questions. So slaves were conditioned to respond in an ignorant, dumb, or stupid, stereotypical way to give reason or excuse for not understanding orders or instructions and as a way of avoiding punishment but reinforcing a stereotype of ignorance. In the South, free blacks were generally forbidden from providing written declarations or documents that were not provided to them by a white person. In the North, where there was no slavery, small formal and informal schools were provided for some free blacks in small numbers, but these schools were very selective and taught the agenda of religious and abolitionist organizations that were sponsored. The establishment of public schools, though, saw some integrations of northern schools, but primarily schools were separated by race with a greater preference to white schools. The end of the Civil War forced former slave states, by law, to change their constitutions requiring equality in social life, one of the most oppressive to these social these southern states with a social order that was well ingrained was the idea that they be required to provide equal education to blacks. And from the end of Reconstruction to after the Civil War, that's the late 20th century, the early 1970s, the majority of the South even if they did provide facilities that were mandated by the Supreme Court and federal law, they refused to integrate on the basis of social equality. And in the early years, those that did open up schools, those schools were only open for a few months a year. Many of them lacked water, plumbing, or even heat in the wintertime. Some were merely shacks. There were shortages of qualified teachers. Where there were qualified teachers, many of them taught all 12 grades and often were paid poorly. Most blacks, especially in rural areas and throughout the South, felt that schools were a waste of time for their children who would be better off working in the field. Now, those blacks with the income and understanding to send their children to small private schools did so. But this was well beyond the range of most poor blacks who were completely dependent on the government for education, especially when these parents were themselves illiterate. Now, when school became mandatory to receive federal benefits, that is, you could not keep your children out of school. As a matter of social policy and truancy laws, black schools were required to be opened. In these cases, southern schools employed black teachers, principals, and administrators to run these schools, but under no circumstances were blacks allowed to teach white students. Black schools under black administrations were given limited resources for repair and upkeep of schools. 
black teachers and administrators overall received lower pays. Black schools were provided with used and limited numbers of books, textbooks in all subjects. Typically, black schools received teaching materials that were being disposed of by white schools. And the creation of a dual school system, despite being economically unfeasible for many southern school districts, they did so anyway. In some cases, entire school districts in the South shut down for more than a year to oppose integration of schools. After hundreds of years beyond the end of slavery, after numerous delays and Supreme Court orders, Southern schools begrudgingly district by district, started taking affirmative actions to integrate schools as a remedy for unequal budgeting. The tool they used to do this, to take this affirmative action, was busing. By busing students to various schools to provide racial balance, the budgets would be equal and not based on race, but by school. But many whites responded to this by removing children from public schools or moving to the suburbs or outside the school district. And the overall impact of this white flight was a loss of population, a loss of white students. And in this case, additionally, the unintended consequences of lowering the quality of many predominantly black school districts. Now, over time, blacks, given the opportunity to obtain a level of education in all areas of life, have been provided a full understanding of all white culture, history, achievement, ideology, philosophy, and social empathy. Understanding whiteness has been ingrained in black Americans through education. But how have whites learned about blacks? Now, prior to the 1930s, it was generally taught in schools that blacks made no major contribution to American life or world affairs that was not influenced by whites Of course, there were noted exceptions or exceptional blacks, Benjamin Banneker, Frederick Douglass, etc. Therefore, blacks did not exist except as an afterthought, often referred to as servants and mascots in most cases. Most whites during the era of radio and TV learned about blacks only from media stereotypes that required black actors to sound like a particular kind of black to be believable. Yes, sir, boss. Kid Dynamite. In the most extreme cases of blacks not being black enough for media, there was the very popular Amos and Andy show, one of the most popular radio programs in history. It was played by two white actors who were thought to be able to better articulate the real soul of black people. Now, throughout time, blacks themselves have also exploited these stereotypes to make a living, to get into show business. Minstrel shows with black actors were even more popular than whites in blackface, but ironically... Blacks in blackface never made the big time, like, say, a white actor, Al Josen, one of the most popular and successful actors in America, using blackface. Blacks were not black enough to pretend to be black. There have been numerous fictional representations of blacks that satisfies the idea of what whites have of the general idea of blackness. The most disturbing source of this information comes from 
bogus sites and, and an uninformed information, a rewriting of American history known as revisionist history that seeks to explain the causes of the Civil War, the nature of slavery, and religious ideology and rituals to apologize and to explain the causes of the South and slavery and the Civil War. These revisionist ideas come from poorly sourced and written books by amateurs and non-historians, propagandists, conservative media hosts and white nationalists and other conservative websites and this information is regurgitated and spit around over and over again as fact. But rarely are these misideas informed by regular contact with blacks, but only from limited and superficial encounters reinforced by media images. Summer always ended too soon, and I was conditioned to be apprehensive about the start of school. The yearly reprieve, my mama bought me this, was no longer an acceptable pass in high school for coming to school dressed in clothes with pins, patches, homemade hems, out of style or worn often enough to be recognized by other kids. We were poor and my mama had a weak understanding of teenage school standards, pressure, or the logic of investing in it. The dread and fear of going to school and being the victim of teasing and humiliation ended only at the end of the school year, the summer. In the summer I could wear less and more often with few social consequences. The times I was teased because of what I wore to school were too numerous to count. There were the numerous times I split my too tight pants, the time my jacket was scorched after leaving it too close to the kerosene stove to dry, the bell-bottom pants and a yellow shirt with ducks I wore in the school gym that drew the whole school's attention and Verbal assault on me. My level of humiliation was too much to even express. More than once I didn't attend a school event or activity because I had nothing to wear and that would be acceptable within the standards of high school. The decision to drop out finally came to me after an encounter with a teacher who said to me, Just look at you. Why do you even bother? You don't care about anything. Look at the way you dress. Why do you even come to school like this? I thought, you're right. Why do I bother? Why in the hell do I put myself through this? I'm never going to amount to much anyway. But this would be my best summer ever coming up because I would never go back to school in the summer and my mind and my heart would never come to an end. At the very start of summer I was fortunate enough to hear about men being hired to work on the docks and loading ships at Richmond's deep water terminal. They were not asking for IDs, proof of age, social security cards or anything and it paid one whole dollar more than minimum wage. This was perfect. The docks were hot and radiated heat off the asphalt and concrete, right up to the dock's edge of the water that seemed to reflect heat as well. We climbed down into the ships after large panel doors would open to reveal bales of tobacco. We used 
metal hooks to grab fifty and hundred pound bales and load them onto pallets that were being lowered into the ship with a crane. And multiple pallets would be coming in at a time, swinging back and forth, sometimes hitting people, hurting them badly. But this wouldn't stop the work. The halls of the ship, the holes where we worked, were dusty and hot. And we sneezed and we coughed a lot. And oftentimes it was hard to breathe. The heat was high. And no more than once a day did they ever lure water into the hole. And we only had a few minutes to drink. Often everyone was not able to even get a small cup of water. We worked non-stop, pushed by foremen who wanted us stacking and pulling bales all the time without stop until a one-hour break that I spent sleeping trying to recover from the first half of the day. The day seemed to come and go as a blur, as the summer months dragged on in an endless and relentless cycle of work, sleep. I had my mama's respect for trying to man up and, and if I was not going back to school, I could work. I had money I could give to her. But I never went anywhere. I slept a lot. I ached a lot. I fell asleep a lot with my clothes on. And my mama would cover me with a blanket. And she would make me a big working man's lunch. The most days I could hardly eat. Because I was too tired. And I would eat them on the way walking back home after work. After some of working like a slave, school seemed so much easier. And I made the decision. I was gonna go back. And mama didn't say anything. And I used the money to buy new clothes. And I was different after the summer in many ways. I was different physically. I was different mentally. And people treated me different. Not with hostility and mocking. And not with love or admiration. But with indifference. But it was not the clothing. It was me. I was harder. I cared less. I paid less attention. This school would be different. And the next summer, I would be in the army. You know, it can be very tiresome to talk to people that are convinced that they know more about your people than you do. For me to talk to people who are not black but know more about black people than I do, sometimes in person, a lot of times on social media, and I often wonder how often whites and other minorities who encounter people who want to give you a lesson about your people, your religious background, your gender, your sexuality. And I get this all the time. And a lot of this is motivated by extreme and extremely ignorant people 
and extreme arrogance. People often refer to something they have read or something they were told. And most often, I seldom meet people who've ever taken a single class on black history. Maybe they read a book. Or they heard from somebody who heard from somebody, but they are experts on the black condition. Maybe they read all the books in the prison library. Maybe they read a book about blacks in Egypt from the Black Incense Bookstore. Ironically, all groups do this in some form. Men do this with women. Heteros do this with gays, whites do it with blacks, and yes, I will acknowledge that blacks can do this with whites, with one important caveat. There are almost no blacks in America that don't come in contact with whites on a regular basis, or who have never seen a range of white representation of white culture their entire lives, rightly or wrongly interpreted. Well, this one is done. I'd like to thank you so much for hanging in there with me and showing me a lot of love and patience. Now, you know, a well-funded podcast is able to release on a regular basis. Time spent and the technical aspects of the show can be farmed out. There can be a separation of tasks and better equipment to speed the process. But this podcast is fully listener-supported, and I would love to keep and keep on bringing you stories and podcasts on a regular basis. But if you don't support the podcast, who will? Right now, you can show your love and support by clicking on the donate button on the website. We also have a Patreon campaign going on that's also available on the website on whatsracing.com. Any amount, a dollar, if they allow that, will they allow a dollar? Maybe five dollars. Anything is better than nothing. But this is the only plea I'll make right now. Because I'm giving you this out of love. I recently had the pleasure of uh, winning my sixth month story slam this season in Asheville. And I'll tell you something, I'm very, very honored. I'd love to hear from you. Really, really would love to hear from you and get your feedback about the show. Leave me a five-star review on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook. And share What's Ray Saying, the podcast, to other people. Let them know what's happening. This show is produced by me. With special thanks to Dr. T and Dr. Meredith Evans. Original beats provided by the always amazing Beej Gordy. Until my friends, see you next class. You have been listening to What's Ray Saying, the podcast, hosted by Ray Christian. You can find What's Ray Saying on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. If you've got comments, questions, or feedback, you can always reach us via Facebook, or by emailing what's Ray saying at gmail.com. Ray says each episode is made with love, fatback, chicken feed, and fresh mountain spring water, but none of these are legal tender according to the electric company. To help this listener-supported podcast pay the bills and keep producing episodes like the one you just heard, you can click on our donate tab on Facebook or go to paypal.me slash what's Ray saying. Tell a friend or two or 12 or 20 what you just heard on What's Ray Saying, the podcast. Until next time. What's Ray Saying? What's Ray Saying? What's Ray Saying? What's Ray Saying? He will tell you.
Thank you.